I will give more or less uh, introductory, I, I think, uh, uh, talk to these uh, ideas of uh, how we can find, reconstruct dynamics of oscillatory systems from data, and it is based on uh, long collaborations with especially Michael Rosenblum, but also other colleagues in our group and uh, some medical persons who did uh, also some experiments. So the uh, starting point is that we assume <coughs> that there is a, a large system or relatively large system uh, which can be considered as a coupled dynamical system uh, set up. So there is an individual system which has its own index k, and k can change maybe one, two, three, and so on. And uh, different uh, systems, they are coupled, and altogether the whole description is through deterministic dynamical systems. And uh, the general idea is uh, to reconstruct uh, what we can uh, say about this system, about the coupling, uh, from on the basis of observables. And it is assumed that we have observations from all subsystems. And uh, it, uh, in particular, so in uh, the talk by Tiago, so it was uh, here assumed discrete dynamics, uh, which uh, also assumed to be chaotic. And here we uh, follow another uh, approach uh, which we pursue for some 20 years that uh, based on the idea that the basic process in this system is oscillation. So it is a, each system is oscillatory system, so it produces some periodic oscillations. And these periodic oscillations are coupled and uh, so this is our setup. So there is no chaos here. Uh, there is no excitability. Uh, the dynamics is uh, that of coupled oscillatory processes. And the basic uh, idea, which I will try to explain how you can implement it, is based on the uh, links to our, uh, how one describes such systems theoretically. And theoretically, uh, one of the widespread approaches is a reduction of this uh, dynamics, maybe in a high dimensional phase space, to a single variable, uh, which is called phase, and which uh, rotates uh, without coupling uniformly, and with uh, coupling, so these rotations are uh, non-uniform due to interaction terms, and this is called phase dynamics reduction in the theory. And the idea is to uh, reconstruct not these equations, but these phase dynamics, because phases are essential variables which capture this oscillatory dynamics. And uh, so in the last 20 years, there were many modifications of these ideas, uh, by Aneta and uh, um, colleagues and uh, also other groups, also Klaus Lennart, uh, whom we uh, heard in the first talk, contributed here. <coughs> okay, there are different uh, ideas based all around this phase dynamics. So uh, the starting point, as I said, is the theory. And uh, theory is uh, based uh, just on the property of a uh, oscillatory system. It's a system which possesses a limit cycle in the phase space. Uh, that uh, universal property is that in the basin of attraction of this limit cycle, uh, you always can introduce a variable phase. Uh, which uh, rotates uh, for just one limit cycle uniformly, exactly with the frequency of uh, these periodic oscillations. And then, uh, based on this uh, uncoupled dynamics, there is a standard uh, perturbation theory approach 
uh, for example, described uh, nicely in the book by Kuramoto, uh, which uses uh, smallness of coupling, smallness of this sm uh, parameter epsilon, and in the first order of epsilon, uh, so one obtains a closed equation for the phases. And uh, so this allowed, for example, Kuramoto to derive his famous Kuramoto model and so on. And, but uh, this analysis also says you that your process is an oscillation which is slightly modulated. And here this term, here it has come this phase, which now is not uniform in time. So it is a phase modulation here and small amplitude modulation. So this is how uh, generally dynamics of uh, uh, coupled oscillatory systems uh, looks in the theory. And now, uh, so what I will, uh, starting on this basic idea in my talk, so I will describe how, uh, so what a notion, uh, together with notion of the phase uh, from the viewpoint of reconstruction, there will be an important notion of protophase. And then I will uh, go to two coupled systems, uh, many coupled oscillators, and um, uh, especially uh, so uh, recent um, idea of uh, how you can, in some exact form, achieve phase demodulation with iterated, iterated Hilbert transfer. Uh, not transfer, transform should be here, of course. Okay. So let us start with this, uh, just a simple case where we have one oscillator. This is uh, general equations as I showed for coupled oscillators. And for two oscillators, they look like this. So there is uh, one oscillator with frequency omega one, another with omega two, and there are two coupling functions which uh, we want to uh, reconstruct from the data. And in many cases, theory predicts so that these uh, functions should also maybe probably be decomposed, but this is not necessarily so. There are, could be couplings which you cannot decompose in this, such a product. But in, uh, you can try at least to do this because in many cases, uh, coupling has this form. And uh, the idea is uh, that uh, to obtain, first you need to obtain phase. And here you start with some oscillatory quantity, uh, a scalar quantity, which oscillates, and you need to find the phase. And uh, the common idea is to use Hilbert transform to, together with uh, x of t to find Hilbert transform, another very, another time series x uh, hat of t. And on the phase plane, so here it is, you hardly see, but here it is better seen. So you have some something like a closed loop. And along this loop, you say, so there is one oscillation, and you attribute to this trajectory phase uh, which is uh, here uh, gains by two pi by one rotation, or maybe here you do something else, so along this more complex loop, and again it goes here. But uh, what is here I call theta, and I don't call it phi, so don't call it phase, because as I will argue in the moment, it is just an angle variable, but not the true phase which you define in the theory. So you, one should uh, distinguish between theta, uh, protophase, which I call protophase, and the true phase. And the distinction is that true phase is assumed to rotate uniformly uh, with constant velocity, while protophase doesn't necessarily has this property although it also gains 2 pi when the phase uh, also uh, gains 2 pi. So this is not, uh, in all cases, uh, well, um, how to say, understood, that in fact, when you do this uh, technique of Hilbert transform and embedding, what you obtain is the protophase. 
and not the phase. And correspondingly, the equations uh, here, which you may reconstruct for this variable, will differ from the theoretically uh, derived equations, which uh, is our, our goal. And uh, the, uh, what we suggested uh, in uh, papers, so also some 12 years ago, uh, or even 14, uh, was to make uh, an additional step in the analysis and uh, obtaining a protophase, make a transformation to the phase. And this transformation you base on the property that the phase should be uniformly distributed, which is indeed the case for the true phase without coupling. And with coupling, it is only approximately true. So I will touch this also at the end of the talk. But this is a quite a straightforward transformation. So you find your protophase, you find uh, its probability density, you make a transformation to make this density uniform, and you get a phase uh, which uh, then is uh, much closer to the theoretical one. Yeah? Why, why, didn't, why did you drop the idea of averaging? So you compute the mean phase of the protophase, right, and you get the phase. No, 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 no. It, it's, uh, ju just averaging will, doesn't help you will not help you. you. You see, so it is a... <laughs> okay, it doesn't help. Right. So you, you need real, but you see, this is a invertible transformation. It's not like a filtering. You just make such a transformation. And then after that, it is a more or less a straightforward procedure. You have time series of one phase, of another phase. You can calculate derivatives from the time series. And then you want to have a right-hand side of this equation. You represent this equation right-hand side in a, say, double Fourier uh, representation so that you just have this unknown coefficients of Fourier of this two, two pi periodic function of two variables. And using a lot of data, you uh, calculate this coefficient, say, minimizing a squared error. Or if you in advance know that your system is sparse, so people use what is called compressive sensing, and probably Tiago also did this, uh, but this is name uh, more used by engineers. Or you can use uh, Bayesian in inference and uh, other techniques. So that, uh, uh, here it is a uh, relatively straightforward procedure. And then, uh, so you get these equations of motion. And uh, because so you transformed from the protophases to phases, so you get rid of all peculiarities which are from, come from observables and definitions uh, because the true phases are uh, universal quantities. And these are two examples. So one is, uh, OK, so it is a two coupled metronomes. So there is uh, one ribbon can couple them, or two ribbons. And you observe these oscillations of this pendula. So these are two processes with two different frequencies, how they look like. And this is uh, what you get for the coupling of these two systems. If you don't use transformation to the phases, you just use protophases. And if you do this transformation. And here, the bottom row is the case without coupling. And you see, for protophases, you don't get zero because so the dynamics is not uniform. You get some functions. And, uh, but if you make a transformation to the phases, so here, for zero coupling, you get constants. And uh, these coupling functions, so for two, two ribbons and for one ribbon, they look similarly. <coughs> it is for uh, first oscillator, it is for the second oscillator. <coughs> so it is a quite reliable procedure. Data, uh, you don't need to large amounts. And we applied it to um, a uh, so-called cardiorespiratory interaction. 
So this uh, is interaction between two uh, more or less periodic processes in our body. So one is respiration. So it is, uh, could be several seconds in period. Uh, and uh, another is a heartbeats, which you can measure either through electrocardiogram or through a pulse wave, and which has another period, say, around one second. And we apply this idea of phase coupling to these two oscillators. And here, this is this what uh, are steps. So this is uh, embedding after Hilbert transform because respiration signal is relatively, okay, sign form, so you get such thing. If it is ECG, you see it is rather complex signal, so it will be a um, closed loop, but with several small loops. It's nevertheless, you can calculate here the length uh, along this uh, curve, which will be two protophases. Then you make transformation to the phases, as I described, so you can hardly see the difference, but it is there. And then obtaining phases, we obtain two cup, uh, the coupling function, so we focus on the effect of respiration on the uh, heart rhythm. And uh, so we even will try to decompose this coupling function into uh, phase response curve and effective forcing. And uh, these are examples of um, these coupling functions for different persons uh, for whom we measured using electrocardiogram signal, which is better, and pulse wave is somehow worse. And this is the best case where these both methods are, give almost the same. This is uh, the worst case of a person who had probably very weak interaction, and so it is much more massive functions. And this is average over the sum set of, I suppose, 20 persons here. So you see, so it is quite a nice uh, coupling function, which depends on the phase of respiration and uh, phase of uh, heart. And you can uh, decompose it into um, uh, peer C, so response function of the heart, so there is a, some susceptible region and less susceptible, and the forcing where it is accelerating or decelerating, and uh, the total coupling is the product of these two. And maybe uh, the last thing uh, we, which uh, is uh, interesting here is the following. So, in fact, what we do, we have a phase of the herd, and its derivative is instantaneous frequency of the herd, and it is called herd rate. And we, in fact, represent it at some function uh, of this uh, phase of the herd and respiration. So, it is respiratory action plus the rest. Uh, so the rest is non-zero, and this, the rest, is the action of all other physiological processes or external processes on the heart rate. And so, uh, with this representation, we can subtract these two terms and find uh, some kind of cleansed heart rate where we um, uh, from which we subtracted this uh, respiratory related component. So you can use this analysis not only to characterize interaction of the respiration and of the heart, but to subtract it and to proceed maybe to a further analysis where you think might be there are in other actions of other biological processes with other time scales, but uh, you will get rid of a large component which is uh, mostly visible in the heart rate. Okay, so conclusions to this part where I spoke about two coupled oscillators that it is uh, uh, important to distinguish phase and protophase. Uh, equations which we want to obtain are 
uh, motivated by theory, and in particular, if oscillators are embedded in a complex environment, uh, this reconstruction of uh, their interaction disentangles influences of the rest and of the second oscillator. So you can cleanse this. I have uh, a question. So for example, you have protophase, then you have phase. You do a transformation from protophase to phase. Yes. So you have to, so this is a push forward of n vector field, right? So this means you change the coupling function as well. Uh, sorry? When you do, yeah, when, you, when you go from protophase to phase, yeah. you transform the vector field. Yes. So this means you also transform the coupling. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it, it's exactly the goal of this. I know, it's but the goal of this story, you see? So, because you don't want this. Uh, so this is uh, the true coupling function in the term of phases. It's precise. And this you don't want. No, no, this is precise in my question. So let's say uh, my model, Q is given my model. I measure something. Then I measure something, then I take the something and map to what I believe is the correct equation. Yeah. But actually, maybe I do not recover Q. No, you see, so if you recover the correct phase, then you recover the correct equations. This is precisely my question. So. Yeah, so, but uh, I mean, so you, you see, so it's, uh, you have equations of motion. You can make a transformation and you will get equations of motions in other coordinates. So if you generally have equations, I don't know, Lorentz equation, x, y, z, you can define new coordinates, y, w, whatever, and there will be another equation, so it will be conjugated. So in generally, you don't have a choice, so which is true, which is not true, because so they are equivalent. But in, for the, in this case, there is a, a cho uh, the true case, because so there is a variable which without coupling rotates uniformly, and this is unique, up to shift, of course. And this uh, defines you the equations in the phase representation, which you don't have if you use uh, other variables. We can discuss maybe the later, yeah, okay. Okay, so now if you have more than two units. So there are different notions. It's uh, not everything is so clear as before. So uh, for example, so suppose you have three oscillators and you just put interactions like here, two X on three, one, two. So then you will say, okay, so there are mutual interaction between one or two, and there is influence of two on three, but there is no influence on three on others, and there is no direct coupling one to three. But if you calculate some kinds of correlations or synchronization measures, maybe you will find that all three are correlated. So, and here this could be called functional uh, connections which are not directional and which uh, you can hardly transform back in these arrows. Or if you look uh, what is influences whom and you uh, pick three and one, you will recognize that one uh, somehow influences three. But it, it will be difficult to recognize if it influences directly or through two. Uh, it's indirect coupling. So there are many questions which appear here. And in particular, what can help is that you go not in pairwise analysis, but more in a triplet analysis. For example, if you try to reconstruct a, uh, what is the dynamics of three, not just, just looking separately on one and two, but bringing them together, you easier re can recognize that there is no this link from one to three, but there is one influences only through uh, two, uh, and then it goes to three. So this uh, is, um, okay, 
So, and this is indeed uh, the case. So it's uh, uh, here, you see, so the only additional idea is that it's a triplet analysis when you try to reconstruct equations which include all three phases in a triplet is better than looking on pairwise interactions because uh, in this case, oh, sorry. Uh, you see, so here there is a P stays for P-wise, pairwise analysis and tau stays for triplet analysis. And dots are uh, found uh, coupling strengths for interactions and red dots are non-existing. So in reality, they're zero, but due to analysis, you get some maybe small numbers. And uh, green are existing. So green are well recognized by both pairwise and triplet analysis, but non-existing links are shifted down in the triplet analysis so by one order of magnitude from the diagonal. So it means that you really can here say, uh, you will not have a false positive if you make triplet analysis, but if you make pairwise analysis, there will be a lot of false positive. So indeed, uh, looking on triplets uh, helps to uh, um, reconstruct such indirect influence from direct one. So this is... Uh, uh, message which additionally comes if you have more than two oscillators. Now, uh, large networks. So gen very generic equations uh, could be written in this way. So if you have n oscillators, so generically you have some coupling functions which depend on all of the phases. But practically, so there is a, mm, you don't have such situations. And the one uh, has maybe pairwise interactions or very popular is so-called Finfrey type coupling where there is some here phase response curve and then action from others. So there are more or less also pairwise interactions. So in the theory, so people quite often model Kuramoto equations or kuramoto dyde equations where you have functions of phase differences. Uh, but uh, there could be not pairwise, but uh, coupling which include more than two oscillators. And in this case, uh, you have triplet coupling and the corresponding network becomes a hyper network. Uh, hyper network and because there will be uh, several talks also about this so I decided to also to include some small discussion about high order couplings and hypernet hyper, although it's not just one slide about this so there are uh, at least two ways uh, where uh, these uh, high order terms in coupling appear naturally one is that if you organize interactions through mean fields and moreover through nonlinear functions of the mean fields. And in this case, you have uh, terms in terms of phases like this, so triplets or quadruplets or maybe both uh, of them. And uh, there are many interesting effects uh, in the dynamics uh, related to this nonlinear dependence on the mean fields, uh, which we uh, studied in these uh, references. And there is another context where you have uh, oscillators which are coupled pairwise, but the phase reduction is approximate. And uh, pairwise interaction proportional to epsilon in the original equations lead to expansion in the phase dynamics, including terms proportional to epsilon, epsilon square, epsilon and power three. And uh, if you perform this uh, perturbative theory in uh, powers of the coupling, you will realize so that uh, only in the leading term you have pairwise interactions, but triplets appear in the second order and quadruplets could appear in the third order. So in fact, you will have a combination of a, 
usual network or hip hyper network with uh, triplets, hyper network with quadruplets, and so on. Although here there will be corrections to the basic networks. And uh, you can also use this uh, in data analysis. And uh, here we had uh, this year published a small mini review so that, uh, okay, one can look there how these non pairwise interactions uh, appear in the theory and in the data analysis. And here, I, I just, uh, in the terms of um, uh, reconstructing, just for illustration, how one reconstructs a relatively large network. Uh, so suppose we have uh, different frequencies and we have here different uh, Kuramoto Dider terms. So I suppose in the analysis it will be some network about 50 oscillators with uh, many connections, but some of them are zero, so, but it's not extremely sparse. And the idea is so that uh, you can represent this function as a Fourier series. So your dynamics is like this, and you have uh, just in the spirit also like Tiago represented, you have a known vector on the left-hand side, and here some vectors on the right-hand sides, and here there are coefficients c and s which are unknown. And you use uh, method, method of your choice, so compressive sensing or sparse reconstruction or Bayesian or singular value decomposition to find these coefficients. And uh, indeed, you can do this as in the, here uh, you com I, I compare true coupling constants with reconstructed norms of them. And uh, if you, I have uh, enough terms here, uh, so look on this blue square, so they nearly lie on the diagonal. And here at zero, there are also many points. So there, uh, all coupling terms are uh, nicely reconstructed for such a, uh, okay, relatively complex uh, complex function, which, by the way, comes from the uh, practical um, example of electrochemical oscillators. Okay, so this reconstruction, it uh, hardly depends on the dynamics. So you cannot reconstruct if oscillators synchronize. So this was also a problem uh, in the talk of Tiago where he needed some independence of nodes. And here, independence means uh, absence of synchronization. Because if your network synchronizes, so you have just basically one oscillator, so all observables are interdependent, you don't get any information. But what can you do? You can still use transients. So if you reshuffle your network, then it goes to synchrony, but during this time, you still observe the dynamics. And if you uh, make these uh, um, resettings several times, so you use these transients and you can again reconstruct. And this shows here. So you use 80 transients, so 80 different random initial conditions. Just after a short time, everything synchronizes, but it is enough to reconstruct the coupling coefficients in this network. Okay, so conclusion to this part, so that uh, you can, uh, <coughs> with phase dynamics, using phase dynamics, you can reconstruct even large networks. Uh, so there is one main idea here, that it's better to look on triplets, so that uh, will allow you to suppress some spurious terms. And uh, maybe last remark, so there are also, um, you see, so phase dynamics is simple because it is one dimensional. But in uh, neurosciences, there are some models which are also one dimensional. For example, this popular neural field networks and uh, where you are activities of different sides. So it is not phase equations. So this are, U is equations just uh, on a line. 
and uh, f are some functions, but nevertheless, so you can in the similar way reconstruct this network as well. Uh, I, I will not go in details, but there will be a reference at the end. And okay, now I uh, come to the my how to say uh, topic, which is we just recently uh, done with a student Eric Gengel. And it is, uh, in my opinion, it is sounds for me at least, or looks as some kind of mathematical problem, but we of course, so we don't prove any theorem, we just look how it works and show that it works. But for me, it is just uh, interesting if mathematicians will find maybe something interesting here. Okay, so this is an initial problem of obtaining phase or protophase from the scalar time series. So I try to formulate now the problem as, uh, how to say, precise as or in a pure form as possible. Suppose we have a, a scalar time series of some variable x, we, which variable x is uh, composed as a such form, it is S of phi where S is called a waveform, it is a 2 pi periodic function, some 2 pi periodic function, any function, and phi is a monotonous function of time, it's growing function, which can also be any function, but okay, of course, we, we will assume smoothness and no jumps and such things. And so you, from waveform and the phase, you combine this X, and the goal is to find, uh, uh, to solve the inverse problem. So to find this waveform and to find uh, the phase if we have x. Yeah, so inverse problem to be solved, which is, uh, can be called phase demodulation. You have a modulated signal and you want to find the phase from it. And as I discussed before, so this uh, solution is not unique. So because any transformation of this time, it's coordinate transformation, again gives you another solution. So it's uh, not an unambiguously defined problem because so, and this is of course our old friend protophase. So the, uh, this variable is protophase and uh, the first goal is just find one protophase and one waveform from this uh, family of different protophases and different waveforms. So, okay, at least find one. And then we will uh, discuss a proper transformation from a protophase to the true phase. Okay, so, yeah? You may not have a solution at all, right? No, but my assumption is so that signal is like this. Okay. So, so the signal is, suppose I have such a signal. Okay, yeah, you're right, but, but okay, yeah. Now, how, how, what is practical thing? Now, uh, so suppose we had two observables. So we have oscillating system which has a phase, but we have two observables, X and Y which are, okay, should be independent. So for example, so this is one observable, this is another observable. So one is, has one waveform, but the same phase, another has another waveform, but also the same phase. Now, if we uh, uh, put it on the plane, we will get a closed curve, generally, yeah? So if it is not degenerate. And uh, so this will be easy to now to define the protophase. You just parameterize this curve. For example, practically we will use the length of the curve. Yeah, so you have here, you calculate the length. You make here some, at some point you say it is my phase zero. I calculate the length and then it reaches something. You say, okay, this will be two pi and that's it. And it solves the problem, so it's two-dimensional embedding. But the 
uh, challenge is if we have just only one scalar observable. And the common method used, okay, by, I don't know, 99% maybe of in literature, is to obtain the second observable via the Hilbert transform of the first one. So the Hilbert transform is such an integral, so which roughly makes of cosine function a sine function. And so if you have a cosine and if you, have, you make of it sine and you make an embedding, you will get a circle. And this is what you want. So here it is example. So you have x of t, so such modulated signal. You calculate y of t, it is downstairs here, and you make an embedding. And you get, okay, this is not exactly a closed curve, but looks nevertheless not so bad. And you can say, okay, let us go around this curve and make uh, here again, calculate the length, and make here maybe somewhere a Poincaré uh, section, so which corresponds to phase zero, and this is, will be our protophase. But you already see from here, because it is not a closed curve, but a bend, this will be only approximate. It will need not give you this variable theta one, will not give you demodulation. It will be approximate protophase because it will not have such a property which we need. So if this protophase changes by 2 pi, you don't come to the same place because there is a width here. And uh, so this, and uh, so based on this, but we, now we have uh, some, some kind of idea. And the idea is to iterate this. So this protophase is not ideal, but it is already something better than nothing, better than simple time. So let us use that obtained protophase as a new time. So we have not x yet, uh, now a function of time, but function of this new protophase. And we again can do the same procedure. We can take now Hilbert transform, now integrating not over time, but according to this first protophase, and obtain new y. And it is shown here, and if we now make and uh, put them uh, x and y on this, uh, this embedding, you see it is uh, much, much better. So still it is not, there is some width here, but it is really a much nicer line than before. And you can iterate this. So now it will be new protophase theta 2. And uh, if you make several iterations like here, so you have a signal, Hilbert transform, embedding, calculate protophase, and then use this as a new time and continue several iterations. And then after several iterations, you get a, something which you say, okay, this is now should be a good protophase. And indeed, after 10 iterations, so this is a nicely line. And this means so that this protophase is now a, a good one. Okay, so here I show a really wild example where the phase modulation is no quasi-periodic. It is first large frequency with these oscillations then goes frequency down, then again back, whatever here. And this is uh, with uh, green, it's initial embedding and you see it is nasty line, so it is really white line. But after, I don't know, maybe here I need 30 iterations, this red line is a really uh, very good line and uh, the error goes really down. The, the initial data, is it periodic or not? No, no, you see, this is a, a whatever wild. We just so okay, what a wild phase modulation can we imagine? So let us take first large frequency, which is now here, it is also modulation, then it goes down, then again up, down, whatever. I mean, 
And, and error, there is some rest error because you have integration, so there is error in this integration. You have to calculate Hilbert transform. It is defined on the infinite, so you cut it. So there are some small errors, but indeed you, uh, your error uh, decreases, I don't know, by many orders of magnitude. So this indeed works, yeah? Error of this uh, deconstru uh, reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and this is error, so you can think, okay, can it be a really nasty waveform? Okay, so you put here a waveform with many oscillations, or maybe non-smooth, so this is triangle, and still it is, uh, uh, error goes down. Now, um, some theory, so we developed, but it's very approximate theory. So it is based on the following assumption. So you have weak modulation. So that means so there is some epsilon, so it's not strong modulation. But weak, simple waveform, cosine, and uh, that's all. And uh, because of small modulation, you can linearize everything. And there is a very nice Bedrosian's theorem. Uh, for the Hilbert transform, what does it make in the Fourier space? And at the end of the story, so you get the following transformation of the Fourier spectrum of your error. You see, so this is Fourier spectrum of the error as a function of frequency at iteration n plus one. And you see what, how it works. If frequency is large, then it's uh, multiplied basically by one half and takes one half from larger frequency. But if frequency is uh, close to zero between minus one and one, so here the error just disappears. And here it is a symmetric part. So you have uh, in the spectral space, you have a central part, a small low frequencies where error is multiplied just by zero and all other are multiplied by small numbers and shifted to zero. So everywhere, so altogether, so this uh, error just exponentially disappears. So this is shows you, you have some error, it goes to smaller frequency and disappears here, and uh, also decays at this point, and so everything, indeed, so error goes to zero, so it looks uh, that, okay, at least for us, it is some kind of justification that this procedure, although, but it doesn't say so what happens for strong modulations. So you see, um, this is, uh, what uh, we did recently, so that purely phase modulated signal, one can really reliably extract a protophase and a waveform from a scalar time series by which of this iterated Hilbert transform embeddings. We really looked on different situations and we haven't found any where this method failed. And there is a theory in linear approximation, uh, numerical evidence even for strong modulations, uh, but uh, what you get is some protophase, it's not the true phase. And again, I uh, come to the same more or less slide which before, so you can now perform this transformation from protophase to phase, so and based on the uniformness of the density. And, and uh, okay, here, for simple waveform, you even don't need this because protophase is very close to phase. And here it is another illustration of this convergence. So uh, you see, so here it is a thin line is what you obtain in this procedure and uh, thick line is uh, the true, th true modulation. And here is iteration one, two, three, and 10. And at 10, you obtain that everything is okay. But this is for a very simple waveform. If you have sign, you are almost sure you don't need this protophase to phase transformation. But if you have complex waveform, then protophase and phase can differ significantly. And with our approach, with purely data based, 
error can be reduced uh, by two orders of magnitude, but still there is something rest. Just because this condition of uniform density is only approximate, it's not uh, a true one, and therefore we... Okay, so this is uh, how the coupling function, uh, how it is improved after 10 iteration. So if you don't do this Hilbert transform embedded iteration, so you get something like this, but if you, after iterations you have an error uh, decreases by an order of magnitude um, for this example of periodically driven Stuart Landau oscillator. So I come to the conclusion so that uh, significant is that amplitude modulation uh, should be absent. So we still don't know how to cope with the amplitude modulation. So this iterated embeddings work for purely phase modulation, but if you have both, still we don't have an idea how to cope with this. And these are uh, publications, so this is uh, small networks and protophase versus phase. So this is large networks, triplets, and these are these two uh, se uh, two papers and uh, contribution in this volume uh, for this uh, phase demodulation problem. Thank you for your attention.